Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you for uh, joining us for uh, this 2012 first Handheld Tech webinar. Um, we're excited to have Mickey Larner here from Plasma Technology Systems to share about this. And, and we're going to ask that um, all of our participants, including the ones in the house um, and also the ones um, online, to please save your questions for the end. And um, if you can enter your questions in on the chat box, we'll be happy to relay those to Mickey. And without for much further ado, um, we'll just lend the floor to Mickey and hear about uh, what she has to share with us. Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this is the second time that I have spoken here. Uh, so um, I guess the first talk went well since I got that invited back. Uh, so thank you again. Um, I have a lot of information to cover. So this is going to be a fast ride. I would like to start by saying, while I'm presenting this publicly, some of the information that I am sharing um, uh, I ask that you do not distribute it outside of your uh, facility without permission from uh, me. Uh, in addition, I'm going to be showing a lot of images. And these are representative of products that use plasma treatment. I'm not saying that these are the particular products that we're treating. They're representative. So plasma technology system specializes in vacuum plasma surface modification. And my talk today is going to be focused on the use of the technology for modifying materials, specifically polymers. That's our core competency. I'm going to talk a little bit about our company, introduction to the technology, a review of variables that we consider during our process development, some case studies, and then we'll conclude with questions and answers. Plasma, as we practice it, is used for molecular re-engineering of surfaces. There are myriad applications, and we refer to it as a technology toolbox. One of the advantages of our technology is an engineer can choose a substrate for particular bulk properties, and they can use the surface modification to impart changes to the surface only without affecting the bulk properties. I mentioned that I specialize in low pressure or vacuum plasma processing. In a vacuum, there's tremendous control and reproducibility. Workplace environmentally safe and very low cost of operation. $5 an hour for consumables and maintenance is actually a high number. I mentioned the specialty of, of the PTS group is uh, vacuum plasma processing for polymers. And we've been practicing this in the life science industry since the 1980s. Uh, our group was known as Plasma Science back in the 1980s. We were acquired in 2011 in August by the Plasma Treat group. Plasma Treat specialized in open air atmospheric plasma. The entire organization supports approximately 105 employees, and there are 20 offices globally. And we have a combined installation base of, of over 2,000 systems worldwide. PTS services uh, um, are, are we specialize in manufacturing equipment for technology transfer. So you can bring the technology in-house for uh, commercial, commercial processes. To get to this point, we uh, specialize in process development. You come to us, and we develop a process for you for uh, transferring the technology. For customers who aren't in a position to bring the equipment in-house, we offer contract services. And these services are supported by these additional uh, uh, activities. Locations. Um, Plasma Technology Systems is located here in the Bay Area as shown on the upper map. And the additional locations of the group are noted on the map. The red box items are where our R&D centers are. So in these locations, we offer process development, as well as we can coordinate contract services in these locations. 
this pie is representative of our, our typical uh, industry sales. And I rerun this chart every year, and our numbers fluctuate a little bit, but it's a very good average representation over the past 10 years. Today, I'll be focusing on life science applications. All right, let's move on to the method. There are now five states of matter. And to get from one state of matter to another, you use energy. The Bose-Einstein common state is a little different. I'm not going to focus any time on that. Um, it actually uh, is the, requires the least amount of energy, so it's complicated. Today, I'm going to focus on gas, exciting gas into a plasma. So energy is used. There's many different types of energies that can be used. We specialize in using RF energy to excite gas into a plasma which is a combination of the species that are noted on the right-hand side. Ions, electrons, there's energy, uh, photonic energy, there could be UV energy. And the energy that's created in these plasmas, uh, most people are familiar with uh, the glow, these energies can be used to modify surfaces. These are some examples of naturally occurring plasmas. So the material in a plasma environment is bombarded by all these different species. And these species have energies, as I just discussed, that can break the bonds between, in this case, the hydrogen and the carbon. The hydrogen is extracted, and these free radicals or unsatisfied um, uh, locations on the backbone reach out into the plasma to stabilize themselves. And depending on the plasma chemistry, you can impart unique functionality. Tools. This is a very early vacuum plasma system. Uh, back in the 1800s, it was priced at, I believe, $6. This is our current standard platform and an uh, example of the open air platform. We have a variety of different system configurations. I'm going to fly through this pretty quickly. If you have questions, please ask them at the end. Tumblers, film treatment, film treatment. This is for uh, inline processing of wiring and tubing, vacuum inline processing, 60-inch uh, roll-to-roll. This is a 14-inch roll-to-roll for flex products and membranes. This system is designed for uh, catheter treatment. This is another large batch system. It's a 125 cubic foot chamber. This is Alan. He's our applications engineer in the uh, Belmont facility. Okay. Open air products. The open air jets can be uh, combined so that you can treat rolled goods. This is an EPDM line. We also uh, build and design, design and build liquid injection systems, because we often work with vapors from liquids from modifying materials. Okay, let's get into process and chemistry. The PTS group have broken down our processes into four, uh, excuse me, five steps. Cleaning, activation and functionalization, PECVD or thin film deposition, cross-linking, and grafting. One system, one vacuum system, can perform all of these functions. You can design a process that combines these five steps to work simultaneously. With cleaning, we're ablating or removing weak boundary layers off the surface. With activation and functionalization, as shown um, in the uh, previous uh, cartoon, we are breaking bonds and introducing new functional groups. PECVD allows us to polymerize unsaturated uh, monomers and uh, create thin film coatings. Cross-linking is where we may three-dimensionally link the top two layers of the material. And grafting is where we take a functional surface and we introduce an undisturbed molecule that has a propensity to attach to that functional site. 
Here's a simple cartoon that shows what a plasma-activated surface looks like on the left-hand side, and on the right, uh, this would be your adhesive application, and how the adhesive reacts with these plasma uh, uh, species for covalent bonding, which is your goal. So the next, the next couple of slides, I'm going to just show some examples of materials that we modify. I realize there's a lot of information on this slide. Uh, we, in the, in the medical device industry, we're very active in the fluidus industry, uh, modifying a lot of materials for specialized functionality or wetting or attachment. We modify a lot of the um, materials such as nylon, FEP, PSA, PTFE, uh, and the polyethylenes to make them more uh, wettable for adhesive applications. We work with PEAT and OLTAM, some of the engineering plastics for overmolding and adhesion applications. Metal cleaning and functionalization for attachment. Uh, we uh, treat a fair amount of glass and quartz for cleaning and functionalization. The cellulose cotton, PP, PEE, PTFE, this is representative of membrane materials or non-wovens or wovens that we're treating to uh, increase um, the surface activation or possibly put down a thin film coating to change permeation characteristics. For the elastomers and the silicones, we are either activating, creating stable functional sites for adhesion or putting down coatings to, to change the coefficient of friction. And these are dry coatings. Polyimids are activated for adhesion or clean, and then we work with a tremendous amount of composites, especially in the aerospace industry. For all of these materials, each has a different molecular structure, and each requires different energies to break bonds. So chemistry selection is very important. We want to choose a chemistry that has the uh, desired energies in um, uh, to modify the substrates. This chart, uh, many of you have attended my presentations before have seen it. These are all of the gases and liquids that we typically maintain at our facility in Belmont for R&D. The ones that are highlighted in purple are ones that I will be uh, discussing throughout this presentation. On the right-hand side, are uh, liquids that may, we may use. We do have to introduce these as a vapor. And on the left are gases that we frequently use. Now, each one of these gases requires different energy to excite it. So consideration of power is important, and I will, I will touch on that in this presentation. But in our facility, we say chemistry is the most important starting point. And now, going back to the application examples, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about activation and functionalization. This is probably one of the most common requests, is creating uh, surface functionality or subsequent attachment of something. And these are the common chemistries that customers request or we're imparting on a variety of these materials that were shown in the previous slides. And the purple highlighted ones you need in the file, I'll, I will discuss during uh, the case study. And why would somebody want these functional groups? And this, these are in the uh, life science industry, uh, some typical applications. They want these surface functionalities for the attachment of, of one of these um, uh, subsequent coatings or proteins, where they may just simply be printing on the surface. And I shouldn't say simply, because the uh, uh, printing uh, industry has, has really changed a lot, and people are printing some very complex molecules now. And I'd like to give some PECVD or thin film um, uh, application. And PECVD, I'm not sure if I, I defined it, it's plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition. So we're using plasma to activate the species to create these polymer coatings. The coating thicknesses are submicron. This is what we practice. We practice submicron thin coating. We can go thicker, but our core competency is thin uh, to be used as an alternative to some other 
techniques that uh, yield thicker coatings. The average thicknesses for most of our processes are from monolayers, so maybe 20, 30, 40 angstroms, up to approximately 2,000 angstroms. These are some examples of the coatings that we are um, uh, creating for substrates. I'll talk more about fluoropolymer coatings. The Silox stains are quite popular, and uh, we are using these for a variety of purposes. And that includes changing coefficient of friction, uh, as well as adhesive layers and some controlled um, layers for uh, changing surface energy. We're also practicing this via our open air technology. So we can do these siloxane coatings both in vacuum and atmospherically. And you see aminated, and I also talked about amines on the previous activation slide. We can take certain precursors and we can use them to deposit thin film coatings or we can use them to couple uh, uh, functional whiskers to the surface. So some of these chemistries have dual functionalities depending on the conditions that we choose. And why would you want these coatings on your surface? And these are um, routine requests. And on the right top side, you see hydrophobicity and oleophobicity. Many people come to us and say, I want hydrophobicity. And I ask them, do you really want it just to be focused to water? And nine out of ten times, no, there's some other stuff in there. So hydrophobicity, hydrophobicity oleophobicity, alcohol phobicity, hemophobicity, uh, it's very important for us to understand really what you want the surface to resist. So my next few slides talk about um, how do we approach a process development program. And uh, typically, it starts with many questions. We want to understand as much about your application as possible. And typically, in a customer's application, there are many, many variables that can impact the success of our process. And the next few slides will have lists of these uh, uh, variables. So some of the, 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 tip, the starting point is, what's your substrate? Where do you get your substrate from? Are you only using substrate supplied from one supplier, or are you considering using substrate supplied by multiple suppliers? You just haven't finalized your material selection for a particular polyethylene, for example. Okay. Material finishes. Does that material come in with something on the surface that we need to be aware of? Are there additives in the material, colorants, that could be migrating or outgassing to the surface that could affect our surface stability? Are you pre-cleaning this prior to us processing your part? And if you're pre-cleaning it, what are you pre-cleaning it with? May or may not be important. Also, post-cleaning is an important consideration. How are you sterilizing this? And then on the right-hand side, there's the plasma part. Are we going to be cleaning this? Do we need to functionalize the surface in addition to some sort of deposition or graphing application? What chemistries are we going to consider for that? Uh, plasma process, what type of steps will we have? What chemistries will we select? What type of power conditions are we going to use? Continuous, perhaps we're going to use pulse power. Time, temperature. Do we need to consider temperature of your substrate? As we practice plasma, it's cold gas, so we control the temperature so we can work with polymers. Sometimes, depending on the material that you're working with, you may need to further cool it or possibly heat it. What's the temperature of the chamber? And what's the temperature of the liquid that we need to introduce uh, in, as a vapor? Additional variables. And these are variables that are going to potentially impact the stability of this plasma coated or activated surface. Are there impurities that are going to migrate to the surface? Are there additives, as similar to the previous slide, that are going to migrate to the surface? Are there weakly bound species on the substrate? Is there um, uh, unusual or uneven molecular weight distribution throughout your molded part? 
Again, sterilization technique, cleaning steps, handling. How are you handling this? We've seen gloves come in that have contaminants. Glove selection is important. Packaging materials. What are you putting this treated product in after uh, for storage? <laughs> If you're using a Ziploc bag, I can guarantee you there's something in that that may outgas and could cause a problem on your substrate. And storage, you know, elevated temperatures for polymers could be a problem. Then there's validation methods, and this is a tricky one. Most of our customers come to us and say, I want a surface energy of X, or I want a contact angle of Y. And we find that in discussions with our customer, that's not really representative of the actual application. So these are, there are many different types of validation methods to qualify the success of a treatment. And, and this important consideration of, uh, of these is uh, often necessary. Okay. Now, moving on to our case studies. And the case studies that I'm presenting take into consideration um, what we've just talked about. And I've tried to pick ones that are illustrative, illustrative of, um, of uh, how we approach uh, process development and uh, the, the unique things that can happen. I'm going to talk about amination of the EPTFE membrane in chemistry selection. The second case is activation of FEP heat shrink and misleading surface energy measurements. Case three, what's the effect of cleaning chemistry on the adhesion of a fluoropolymer coating? Case four, what's the effect of power on the thickness and species concentration for PECVD or captosilane process? Case one, so a customer has an EPTFE membrane that they wanted to aminate. Unsure whether they want a primary or secondary amine. Um, there, there are a lot of questions that we had and the customer also has. They weren't really sure what format they needed these amines in. So we ran a very wide study. Um, we looked at a minimum of 16 different processes using, oh, what is it, four or five different precursors. And you can see that the concentration of fluorine on the surface and the oxygen and nitrogen incorporation varies considerably for each one of these chemistries. For, for uh, some of these chemistries, we ran a few different conditions. The amino silane, it looks the same as untreated control. We obviously didn't pick the right conditions or it's not the appropriate chemistry for modifying this EPTFE membrane. However, for the alumine chemistry, uh, we, we definitely saw a change with a certain set of conditions where we had considerable de decrease in the fluorine on the surface, uh, present on the surface, and in, in incorporation of the um, desired oxygen nitrogen. So if we had just looked at the amino silane chemistry, or perhaps just the amino, excuse me, the ammonia chemistry, we may have missed this altogether and not provided the customer with the desired surface property. Case two. So a customer had an FEP heat shrink that they wanted to activate for adhesion. They were using a, a subsequent um, uh, adhesive mechanism uh, to secure this FEP heat shrink to, the, to their product. It was not cost effective. Uh, They're bonding the FEP heat shrink to an adhesion of a UV cure afterwards. And uh, for this development um, program, similar to the previous one, we looked at 18 different chemistries. And we varied uh, power from any of those conditions. The customer said, I, I need, I think he said, I need 70 dyne. I said, whoa, whoa, I don't know if 70 dyne is going to really give us what we, you know, I don't know if that's going to tell us whether we're going to have success with your adhesive. Also, he needs stability of this FEP heat shrink for 12 months prior to his potential assembly application. So in addition to finding the right surface groups, we need stability. Now there's a lot to look at here, but the key thing is the dyne. On the left-hand side, you see 70 at the top, zero at the bottom. Untreated, uh, the surface energy, our kit, uh, 
stopped at 30. Uh, but the, the, the dime value for untreated was less than 30. And you can see some variation in the surface energy for each one of the processes, of the 18 processes. I did skip a few processes that I didn't think were relevant to, to the presentation today. You can also see some of the stability uh, dime surface values. And this is, these are the results from the chemical testing. With every process, we were at least 3x greater than the untreated control. Every process. Even though the dime value on some of them was less than 40. Okay. The yellow line, these are the samples, with the exception of the control, these samples were aged for two months prior to the uh, chemical testing. So if the customer had said, I want 70 dine, and we said, fine, we'll, we'll charge 70 dine, and we had provided it to him and, and not reached that 70 dine, he may have thrown out all the samples and said, plasma doesn't work. So this is a great example of how it's important to choose the right validation method, um, ideally simulating your actual application. And so this customer, uh, the plasma processing equaled millions of dollars in savings per year because they were able to eliminate three steps that were quite laborious. Uh, I'm going to skip through the next two slides in the interest of time, but the, sh the short of it is, is they're just showing the different incorporation of species to the different processes. And we also saw some um, contaminant incoming, we're assuming silicone on the FEC surface uh, that was clean very effectively with one of the processes. Uh, the next study example illustrates um, the importance of surface preparation. Uh, this application was for a customer who has a peak product and they wanted some additional um, corrosion resistance on their peak. So they asked for a fluoropolymer coating. It's cheaper for them to put a fluoropolymer coating on peak than using a fluoropolymer as their bulk substrate. So we ran, similar to the previous applications, we ran a lot of different processes where we varied chemistry selection, we varied surface preparation um, to understand the effect for the particular application. And I'm highlighting processes 9, 11, and 22. You can see on the left-hand side, this is Angstrom, uh, the measurement is not in Angstrom. On um, process 9, uh, there's very, very thin coating. Process 11, we had uh, a considerable variation in the coating thickness. And process 22, we had a very tight, uh, uniform coating that was a little less than 1,000 Angstrom. All three processes are identical PECVD chemistry. The difference is solely surface preparation. So if we had not chosen the right surface preparation method, or we had not performed this type of evaluation, and again, we may not have been successful with this application. We needed an oxygen CO4 cleaning to prepare the surface. That gave us the most effective coating results. Oxygen alone wasn't enough. There, there is some influence in time. It's possible we could have run a 20-minute oxygen cleaning and gotten to the point that we needed uh, for a process of 22. Um, this was early work, and we um, optimized this process considerably, and we were able to get to a two-minute cleaning, followed by a uh, approximate uh, ten-minute deposition. Continuing um, discussions about fluoropolymer coatings are now what the effect of conditions are on the coating properties. And this is some work that we've been uh, conducting with Anasus, who specialize in nanothermal AFM or AFM and other AFM techniques. We presented a couple of posters, and we're about to present a third. So our work is continuing uh, with um, this technique for evaluating the PG of our deposited fluoropolymer coating. So for this application, we looked at many different power uh, combinations. We also have evaluated pulsing power to understand the effect on the coating properties. And as seen in the um, blue, um, the, the, I think it is blue probably, hopefully on everybody's computer. 
this particular combination of um, power, and this is a pulsed power uh, for a peak power of 600 watts, gave the coating that had the highest TG. A continuous power condition wasn't as desirable um, to, you know, we weren't able to attain the desired um, uh, resistance uh, necessary for this particular fluoropolymer coating success. And I mentioned that we are continuing this work. Uh, we are also um, uh, confirming the influence of the thickness of the coating and whether or not that's affecting the, um, um, the, the sensitivity of the TG measurements. So it's possible that some of the, uh, the continuous, these two processes, if, it's possible that they were very thin coatings. So the thermal um, tip just went through the coating rapidly. And this is a thicker coating, so it went through, there was, there was more of a coating uh, to permeate. So we'll be presenting some more information at the Adhesion Society next month. And these posters are on our website. And so the, the uh, nanothermal ASM was conducted on a glass slide that had this fluoropolymer coating. And this is a representative um, uh, ASM, uh, excuse me, X XPS um, uh, Tom species concentration chart for the coating on that glass surface. And as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of fluorine incorporation. Again, continuing with these fluoropolymer coatings, this particular slide shows an example of choices of the precursor or the chemistry. So we looked at a fluoroacrylate and a hexafluoropropylene. The substrate was a cellulose non-woven, basically a, it was a paper towel, which created a lot of membrane material. And as you can see, with the two different chemistries, it yields uh, different um, chemical compositions. And this may be important because one may provide holdout or resistance to um, a unique solvent or chemistry than the other. And the last case is the evaluation of power conditions on the introduction of um, sulfur functional groups on, on recaptosilane. And Stanford um, conducted most of this work using our uh, PS0500 system. And they were introducing the mercaptosilane in a wet chemistry. And many wet chemistries can be considered for plasma deposition. So he, uh, uh, Henrik Pearson, came to us to try to introduce this particular, um, this particular mercaptosilane in a plasma phase. And as I noted, I'm going to show how the coating properties vary depending on the parameters that are used. And what we found with this particular study is as increased power, it was great for the thickness of the coating, but it, it really adversely affected what functional groups we wanted present on the surface. Uh, what we did find is also the PECBD deposition allowed a very smooth coating in comparison to the wet chemistry, where they were getting these uh, uh, polymerization um, agglomerates on the surface. It's just a cartoon of, of what we did. We functionalized the surface and then came in with the mercaptopropyl trimethoxysilane in a subsequent low power step. The subject was glass. And uh, this is an illustration, or excuse me, this is an AFM image of the coating properties on the left in the liquid phase and on the right uh, via the PECVD process. So very thin, and we don't have these peaks. The uh, coating roughness is shown in the previous slide, uh, the, shown here in, in angstrom. Uh, the PECVD coating was around 40 angstrom, and the liquid phase application was around 90 angstrom, which was 
too thick for this particular uh, customer's application. So when power was evaluated as the variable for the recapture side lane process, uh, we definitely saw a correlation between the thickness of the coating. However, power adversely affected the, 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 the introduction of the sulfur species, which was what was desired for the subsequent application. So again, like some of the other examples that I've shown, if we had selected 200 watts, 300 watts, 400 watts, we would have missed the uh, processing window for this particular application. So I'd like to conclude by saying that it's important to understand all the subtle differences in the effect of the plasma process and the variables related to your material, uh, your surface preparation, and your subsequent steps. Um, uh, to, it's, it's important to understand these so that we can design a process that is successful for your application. And with our knowledge about polymers and the 30 years practicing plasma, uh, in combination with a customer's open dialogue about their material and application, um, uh, we can typically be successful or if it's not the right technology, we can typically evaluate very quickly whether or not plasma is the, the means for providing the desired surface. And with that, I conclude. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions and uh, go back and cover some other slides, or I, I brought some additional slides um, for review if necessary. Thank you. Uh, so you're talking about uh, packaging solutions. Do are a lot of your clients going to you for like intermediate or intermediate steps in the process, or are you making final products? Uh, we are we have, we offer contract services. Mm -hmm. So if a customer is not in a position to bring the technology in house, uh, or, or it's not the goal. Um, we offer contract services, so we would work with the customer to identify all of the um, specifications required for that process, including packaging, uh, and run the process at our facility, and, and then either sell it to uh, the next um, the um, the next part of the chain for assembling or manufacturing the product, or it goes back to the customer for assembly. We had one online question. Is, um, how do you measure the thickness of coating? Does the PCBD coating, and he's referring, to, um, this person's referring to slides. Okay. Uh, lithometry can be used, or profilometry can be used. Um, so back to slide 57. Uh, can you exit out so I can and select slide 57? It's up here. I believe they used the lithometry for this, and uh, I can confirm that if necessary. So that was the method that DuPont used. They actually did the measurements of these coatings, and it was on a silicon wafer. And um, uh, profilometry is, with profilometry, having a um, masking of the product so that you have step height is, is necessary. The lithometry, from what I understand, is you can use the index of refraction to determine what the, the uh, coating, um, to help determine the coating properties and determine the thickness, what the coating is in the thickness. I hope that addressed the question. Are there any more questions? Sure. Uh, for the a few slides after this, you show the difference between the wet chemistry versus PECBD. Uh, is when you check the surface, do you, uh, you, you also check for uh, 
like erroneous armor shades that happen on the surface. Um, so the picture was a good backbone of the thing. Did you have to check for uh, backbones that sticking out of the surface? Or? Well, I think that's going to depend on the technique that you use. I, I know that um, I think AFM has some limits as to uh, the area resolution. I'm not exactly sure what it's going down to these days, whether it's down to 40 or 30 angstrom. Um, but XPS or top sims is sometimes used to understand um, the structure of the species that are on the surface. Is that? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, with the AFM, you can see the topography. You can't see, it's, a, it's looking only at the topography. You can't see what functional groups are present. And you, yeah, you show that you don't have to think of a Yes. With yeah, the um, also the, the wet chemistry phase, from what I understand, was a very long process, and uh, it's not as controlled as when working in a plasma. Uh, so the um, the use of plasma for working with a lot of silanes is is um, uh, being more adopted. We, and there's many different silanes that we can introduce via uh, plasma chemistry. And control the properties in a very quick process. That process is three minutes. Mm -hmm. Then that one slide you showed the stem cell scan increase. Yes. So what makes this stem cell scan increase? They there was actually a covalent bonding between the functional groups that are created on the FEP surface and the particular adhesive. The assumption is is with the untreated FEP, there's no adhesion whatsoever. So you just had um, uh, failure at the adhesive substrate interface. With plasma, we are actually creating covalent bonds or interface so that you get bonding um, reaction uh, attachment of the um, adhesive. And um, that there was a slide that I showed early on that had an illustration of a, fun a cartoon of a functional site and then it showed an adhesive coming in and how it linked. Now, we all, yes, and we always ask, I, I, I didn't touch on this, but we always ask what's the adhesive you're using, what's the reaction method, try to learn as much as we can about what that customer's subsequent process is, how are they doing, is it UV cured, condensation cured, all of that's important for us to understand to be able to design the correct surface functionality for the subsequent adhesion step. And that goes the same, you know, for a lot of the um, uh, biomolecules and proteins and cellular interactions. Sometimes linker chemistries are used. So it's important for us to understand what does that linker chemistry want to bond to? What can we, how can we form a reaction? And, and with plasma, um, it is a means for obtaining covalent bonding. But what is the plasma treated? It will still have the same basic properties. So, you, don't do so that it, you can't visibly see a difference. The bulk properties are the same. We did not degrade the surface of the FEP. We didn't get the heat shrink, which is important. We didn't we didn't um, shrink the material in any way. Um, and also, what I did not discuss is that customer looked at the influence of the plasma on the quality of the adhesive bond. So they did two types of aging studies. One of them was looking at the plasma-treated FEP for up to a six-month or a year period prior to doing the subsequent adhesion step. The other thing they did is they bonded on day one, for example, and they put those in the aging oven as well. And they pulled those out and looked to see if there was any deterioration of the bond because of the plasma treated surface, and there was none. And I, I noted who did that. We did that work with um, Venus, now Covidian, uh, and, and Stephen, Stephen Lee was the um, uh, engineer working on that program. He was methodical. He was great working with them because they were flexible. They weren't stuck on 70 dimes. They understood and appreciated it, and it enabled us to be successful. But isn't that in one slide you also said that it's not the problem? This particular application, he needed surface stability of the non the, the FEP for at least 12 months. We have a lot of customers who need surface stability for two years, especially in the fluidics industry, because we're pre
creating um, or activating surfaces for better wetting of a cartridge or a fluidic device gets stuck on a shelf somewhere. So that's you know just one of our core competencies is surface stability. Same with silicone. Some uh, customers. Have you guys done a study that how long to remain stable once you use our cartridge? For for what material? And, and we have looked at um, a variety of materials from the fluoropolymers, different fluoropolymers, uh, to polyethylene, to COC, COPs, um, to polystyrene. Um, I also know in our, we have 30 years of data. So I'm sure I could pull up many, many other reports from the vault. The ones that I just noted are ones that I've specifically been involved in. Um, for COC, uh, COP materials, two years, we've done two years. We detained two years. Now, take, keep in mind that if a customer comes in and they have a subsequent adhesive application, or um, perhaps they're doing some subsequent converting, you got to watch out. We had one customer who came in and we found that a release layer that they were using in one of their subsequent converting processes was had silicone on it. So, shelf life was gone because the silicone was trapped at the surface and contaminated it. So these are all, all the variables that we take into consideration and we ask a lot of questions. Or I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, most, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is a lot of people come and they just think plasma, you turn a knob, you put something in, boom, it works. And if it doesn't work, they throw it out. And it's important to understand the, um, the, um, you know, the versatility and the flexibility of the technology. I have um, two additional questions. Okay. So one is when you show the slide of different properties that you like to like the OEM, the CA, the are there properties on that list where you would have an either or where you can't have both? Or that you mean we would be able to have water phobic but not oil phobic. Yeah. Well, if, if a customer, how do you answer this? Is that where you would hide any of your We, we like, may, or we are going to play around with that coating. Mm -hmm. So for the for the oleophobicity and like alcohol resistance, for example, there's many different precursors that we can use that have back in certain conditions have varying degrees of a holdout. And um, mo all of them hold out water. But on the chemistries that we choose for typically just for hydrophobicity, they typically aren't going to be resistant, hold out the oils and alcohol. Um, there are some unique things that we've been doing with the styloxanes, which have selective adhesion properties. So they may bond to something with non, with um, non eliminating non-specific binding of something else. If you can, same with chemistry, same with functional chemistry. We have to, a customer may only want to bind something very specific. So an oxygen chemistry may provide too much variability depending on what substrate is. So we may choose a more advanced chemistry that's going to provide a very specific chain or, or, or you know linker chemistry control to a specific functional group. And my second question mm -hmm. was for the geometry of the design of whatever your design yep. is. Um, I mean, sharp edges are not good? Or are, I mean, are there certain properties that you definitely don't want in design, especially if you would like a plasma you might want that done more? So one of the advantages of technology um, is that we're working in a primary plasma. Your part's engulfed by this active species. It's not line of sight. And uh, so it's an ideal technology for treating a three dimensional or multi geometrically shaped part that have um, maybe some wells or some blind vias or nooks and crannies or sharp turns. Um, also, I noted how our technology, our coatings are really thin. So we, so the, one of the advantages of that is that we're often able to uniformly coat something where a thicker coating may, may not adhere in that sharp corner. Um, there is a limitation in the ID of a, of a tube. Um, there are means to treat the inside of tubing, but that is probably the, the biggest limitation in the industry. 
The design of our equipment enables us to treat so many different formats. And fixturing is another variable that I don't think I talked about. You do have to consider fixturing. Would there be a way to uh, design a fixture to support um, the component balls being plasma treated to apply two surface layers or more than one uh, surface to it? So in the interest of uh, the two emission hybridizing the part, you had the, uh, the, the need for multiple surfaces. Yes, so there's a couple of things. One is some technologies that are practicing wet coating, the coating, for example, that may be used as an antimicrobial. Parts may be fixtured and treated in a plasma system to activate the surface to then go, and then the rack is pulled out and we go into a subsequent step. Um, within our chamber, uh, we can run a multiple step process. So there was a slide where I showed the five different types of processes that we typically practice. We can activate a surface, and then we could put down something on top of that surface. As far as selective, you do need to look into masking um, if you wanted one area to be treated and not. And, and customers have evaluated a variety of different masking techniques. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK. The only other question online, I mean, they just, they just acknowledge that you answered. Great, great. Okay. Well, my, um, uh, I think my email address is definitely on the presentation, and, and folks should feel um, just welcome to contact me with any questions. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you for joining us for. Um, this webinar, both the people present and also um, those um, in, in person and also those online. And um, yeah, I'll be happy, we'll be happy also on our site to forward any information on to um, Nikki Liner um, if there are any further questions. And we have a recording that we'll be, we'll be able to send a link out for. Um, I just also want to take a brief moment to announce that also next month, what our um, webinar um, series is going to continue in the last week of February, the fourth Thursday. It's, we're going to have a discussion on 3D printing um, from Kinera. They're going to come in and talk about that topic. And we'll be happy to also hear any feedback about our series and also any additional topics that you'd like to see in our series. Um, please let us know. So thanks for your attention and um, joining us. And we'll hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.